It's ready. You're live. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm like, howdy. Okay, so this morning what I wanted to talk about is one mistake a lot of people make, and I have so, so, so many questions about this, and this is what I wanted to cover today, of course, partially, because then I take questions. But a lot of people want to mix different breeds, different sizes, different ages, and so you can just imagine the different questions I get about that. Like, you know, can I mix this one and that one? And I just, like, it's endless. So I just wanted to cover that a little bit and make it, like, more simple for people so they can realize, you know, you can mix chicken successfully. That's for sure. And it doesn't matter, like, if you start out small and you just get, let's just say, two or three, four chickens, and you're, you're good at it now, and you're like, oh, yeah, I love this. This is so much fun. We love the eggs. You know, I'd like to get a few more and you have room to get a few more. <clears throat> so, like, now these chickens are one or two years old and you want to get more, you definitely can, like, you know, get more and add them into that flock. That is doable. Sometimes it's a little tricky and you have to, like, you know, pay very close attention to do it and it might take a little bit of time, but you can still do it. It'll work out okay. And another thing is babies. You know, they're like, well, I have some babies four weeks old, and I have some babies eight weeks old, and can I mix them? And whew, it just goes on and on. So babies, you have to be careful about mixing babies. I've mentioned this in the past that sometimes when you have little tiny fur ball babies, just fuzz balls, the size of a ping pong ball, and then you have older babies that are triple that size or quadruple that size, you, it is very hard to mix those, and the reason being is the bigger ones, they all like to pile up and keep warm. The bigger ones literally get on top of those little tiny ones and squish them down and suffocate them. So you have to be very careful with the little itty-bitty babies. Like, definitely keep those sizes the same, in the same tub, and the bigger ones, like, you know, keep in their own tub, their own space, because you don't want your little, your little fuzz balls to just be suffocated and squished. Of course, it doesn't happen to every single one, but it does happen often. Another thing you have to consider as well, some people will write to me and say, you know, they're, somebody gave them adult chickens. So they already have some chickens and somebody's offering them some adult chickens. And I always say, just just slow down like don't instantly go yes and take them like i always will go over have a look at them see how they look health wise you know do they look like anything's going on like they have mites or you know they're sneezing like just their overall general health i'll always go have a look at them first and see what kind of condition they're in while you're over there looking at them, make sure you see what kind of breeds they are. And then if you're not sure, like try to look that up so you can see the temperament. That's all you're going for. You want to see the temperament of that breed. Not all breeds mix perfectly because some chickens have a sweet temperament, mellow, sweet. They just kind of do their own thing and they're just not flighty. They're calm. Other breeds have a more alert, feisty, forward temperament. And sometimes when you mix those two breeds in a coop, you know, the sweeter, more mellow ones will get bullied and pushed around by the more feisty, forward breeds. So sometimes that isn't actually a good mix in a coop. I personally have learned that through the years, and I like to keep all the temperaments the same in my coop. I just think it's just much more pleasurable to watch them when they're all getting along. I think they lay better because everybody's calm. I'm looking down because Daisy's loose. I don't want her to come and bite my toe. <laughs> um, you know, that's how I like to see my coop. I don't like to see a lot of like darting around, somebody chasing somebody. And, you know, I just personally, I just don't like to see that. So 
I, I do like to choose breeds that have a similar temperament so everybody can get along nicely. And again, as adult chickens, you can introduce a new, um, you know, a new br chickens to your already established coop. You can do that. Make sure you have room. Make sure your coop is plenty big. You always have to have more room than you think. That's the key, more room than you think. Don't crowd them in there. You might say like, well, I saw this coop and there was tons of chickens in this little coop. And yes, yes, there probably was. But the key is, are they getting any eggs? Like that's the whole reason to keep chickens for me and actually most of the people I deal with and talk with, that's the reason they're keeping them is they don't want to buy the store eggs anymore. They want to raise their own healthy, fresh eggs. So when you have 20 chickens crammed into a little coop, you know, they might not be dropping like flies dying, but let me assure you, they are not laying as many eggs as they could be because they're just too crowded in there and too stressed out. So keep that in mind as well. Always make more room than you think. Again, chickens live a long time. It's not like they're just out there for a year or two and you're like, oh, they'll be all right. No, they live five, six, seven, up to 12 years. So it is a long-term commitment when you get a chicken. You know, it's like getting a dog. You know, it lives, it, they can live as long as a dog. So it's not like, you know, this is going to be six months and the chickens are going to die and be gone like it's a gerbil or something. I don't, I don't think gerbils live very long. So, you know, keep that in mind as well when you're considering your chickens. Okay, so now I'm going to see if there are any questions this morning. I have a mic now. Can everybody hear me good? <laughs> we finally got a good mixer. There are actually not really any questions yet. People oh. are just all saying hi. Oh, okay. Well, all right. So I'll... Um, what I'll do now is I'm going to talk about just a couple breeds that are kind of prominent breeds in the area that you might put in the same coop. And that way you'll have the same temperaments. And then I'll mention another group of chickens that are going to have more of a feisty temperament. And then you can just get an idea of, you know, kind of how you're going to keep the chickens. The mellower temperament chickens are going to be, for sure, like the black astralorps. Those things are the sweetest. I almost could have a flock of pure black astralorps. That is how sweet and nice they are. So those are going to be a mellow chicken. I personally find the sex links, the red sex links, to be a very mind their own business, mellow breed as well. I never see them chasing anybody. They're kind of just doing their own thing. They're not flighty where they're just all nervous like, ooh. So I find that the red sex links get along really well with the black astralorps and they just go together and nobody really picks on anybody. Now, if I had to say who's the boss, I would say the red sex links, you know, are gonna be higher on the pecking order than the black astralorps because they just are so docile and sweet. But still, I wouldn't call the red sex links bullies where they're just going to be like attacking. Now, I realize in any breed, any, any animal, there's always exceptions where you're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, I have a red sex links and it's mean. Or I have a black astralorp and it's a mean one, of course. But I'm speaking like overall, you know what I mean? And so... Those two mix really well. Also, there's like cochin chickens that are really big and they're like mellow. Now, they don't lay quite as many eggs, but they do lay and you will get eggs regularly, but they're not like a super layer, which who cares? Like, I don't need super layers because let me assure you, those eggs just keep rolling in and they pile up. You think you eat tons of eggs and you will. But believe me, you still have them rolling in constantly every single day if you do things right. So you will be giving eggs away. That's how many you'll have. So to get a breed like a cochin or something that's not like a top layer is still perfectly fine. And it's a big, mellow breed. You can like pick it up and, you know, it'll, it'll be great if you have kids or you have a like really small backyard. You don't have much room. 
because those bigger, mellower breeds, they don't like run around far. You know, they're happy just to get out in the yard a little bit, just, you know, a few feet, pick around. They're like that keeps them really happy. And then of course, a breed like that also does well in a coop just because, you know, it's, it just is mellow and it's not like super active. It's more like a couch potato. So it's like, it's like happy in a coop as long as it has everything it needs and, you know, you let it out once in a while. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's just a few, like I can't name a million. Okay, so on the feistier side, now maybe if you have lots of acreage, you have a lot of room, you know, you might be able to deal with the feistier ones better because you can have a huge coop, you have a big yard to let them out in, especially if you have a great farm dog, you can just let those chickens out and those active feisty chickens can just go out and about. And so the breeds that are good for that are gonna be um, the Rhode Island Reds for sure. Those are like kind of when you see pictures of farms and stuff, that's what you'll see are pictures of those Rhode Island Reds out. And they are perfect for that. So keep that in mind. But they are, since they have that gusto, you know what I mean? They are gonna be at the top of the pecking order and you don't wanna put them with like somebody super sweet and mellow because they, they just are like, get, you know, they're, they're so easy to chase those mellow ones. It's so easy for them to chase them and get them. So you got to be careful, like, doing that. Okay, so for sure, the um, Rhode Island Reds. And then there's, like, the New Hampshire Red breed. And I find those two to be very similar. You know, maybe the um, New Hampshire Reds are a little more mellow, just tiny bit, tiny bit more mellow. But basically, like... They're a little darker in color, so they even look really similar. And a lot of times people you feel like wouldn't even tell them apart really that much. And then another feisty breed I find is those barred rocks. They are just have the gusto as well. Even though with people, they're fine. They're perfectly nice. They look so beautiful with that checkerboard pattern on them and that red, you know, red wattle. They're very beautiful to look at, very beautiful, those barred rocks. And they're, you know, good layers, good chickens. It's a hardy breed. But again, with other chickens, I find them to be kind of mean and really good fighters. Like they, they can fight, like they are like a boxer. Like they're like this looking at the chicken, <laughs> the one they're fighting and like they wait until they get a good shot and then they like really hurt the other chicken. They seem like they're really smart really smart when it comes to fighting those barred rocks so you know don't put those with some sweet like chubby couch potato coaching because i think it's gonna you know you might say well the coach is bigger in size but i've seen smaller chickens little chickens really beat up bigger chickens so don't think just because size wise it might be a little smaller it's not gonna still be feisty and dominate, you know, mellower breeds. So size really, we're not talking about size, we're just talking about personality here and how they act. Okay, so those barred rocks are another like feisty breed. A flightier breed that seems like it can kind of take care of itself just because it can like, get out of the way, it's kind of flighty and feisty, and are super good egg layers are the um, leghorns. Those leghorns are great chickens. They're just really good egg layers, and, but they're kind of flighty and feisty, so they seem like they take care of themselves really well. The only problem, I, I always get the white leghorns, and so those do get picked up by predators so easy and so fast because you know the predator's like flying around and it's like, there it is, this white chicken, it can't hide. And the same as predators on the ground. You know, some of those other chickens can kind of squat and hide a little bit, and the predator, you know, it might smell them, but it like looking for them. And then, of course, there's the there's the white leghorn, and it just sees it so easy, and it's always the first to go. Always, like, whenever I have leghorns, they just they just get picked off. So you do have to keep that in mind with leghorns, but they're great layers such great layers. You, if you really want the eggs, you take care of those the right way, you'll be, have so many eggs. And they're very efficient egg layers as well. So 
you know, like I've never like calculated it, but some people are really into calculations and they will calculate out like the amount of food they eat compared to the amount of eggs they get and all that stuff. And so supposedly leghorns are like right at the top. Like if you want lots of eggs and very efficient, it's a very efficient chicken. But of course, you know, I have to add the joy factor in there, <laughs> the pleasure joy factor in there. So I don't, I'm not that into the numbers and you know, that's like, I want that because of this reason. I do like a variety and you know, it's fun to watch a variety and the leghorns being a little flighty don't have like the greatest personality because they're just oh, to everything. They're just kind of, I wouldn't say darting around, but you know what I mean? They kind of are darting around. <laughs> So they're not like, I don't know, they just don't seem as pet type chicken as some of those other breeds I've mentioned. <laughs> Talking about me having my microphone finally, uh, uh, C Likes says, finally. <laughs> Talking about me getting a microphone finally. Yes, yeah, C Likes, that is so true. I just think that's going to add to it better. So, you know, he can read the questions, everybody can hear them because it's, it's not in fun or enjoyable when somebody's saying something and you're like, what? <laughs> you can't quite hear them. It's horrible. Jin611 says, Becky, did you ever get goats? Jin611, I did try goats. I thought I would love goats. And when I see them, because I have friends with goats, they're so cute. I always like, you know, go up to the goats. <laughs> when I take care of my friend's animal, she has goats. I have to take care of them and stuff. So. I do like goats and I'm like, oh, I want to try to because I wanted to get completely off cow milk and I wanted to just try to do, you know, goat milk and do all my dairy from goats and just raise it myself, you know what I mean, and make cheese and stuff. So I did get two little goats, but here's the problem. If you do all that, which sounds fantastic and I love all that and I know people that do all that. But you have to be home when you milk them because, of course, you have to breed the goat first to get the milk. So you breed the goat, you have to share it. If it's a healthy goat, it makes plenty of milk where you share the milk with the baby. Of course, the baby gets milk and then you get some of the milk to, you know, can it, make cheese out of it or whatever. But the thing is, you have to be home to milk the goat. And once that process starts and if you have a great milking goat, you can milk for months you'll be getting milk from the goat. So you're going to be home every single day for months to do that. Or you have to have somebody that can do that for you, you know, or with you. And, you know, I don't have anybody that wants to milk my goats. <laughs> so I would have to do it all. And so I just decided at this point in my life, like, I don't want to be tied to milking goats. I don't want to, I call it a milkmaid. I'm like, I don't want to be a milkmaid right now. But I do like that, and that is fascinating and awesome, and you can do so much with goats. So that's why I tried the two I had, and I did breed them, and, you know, I got to that point, and I was just like, oh, I just can't do this, you know. Of course, it is an investment, so I decided I didn't want to do that before I made the huge investment because... When you're going to milk goats, you know, you need your stainless steel buckets. Like, you need, you know, a thermometer. You need stuff. Like, you need your equipment. So before I invested in all that, I had realized that's not really what I want to do at this point. So I rehomed the goats, of course, back to an awesome home. So I, you know, I didn't just like put it out in the newspaper, <laughs> free goats or something. <laughs> it's like, because I don't know, for me, rehoming animals is, I'm very picky. You know, I want it to have a good home. I'd rather give it away free to a good home than sell it for a million dollars to a lousy home. <laughs> Brittany wants to know if you have a greenhouse and how do you maintain the heat in the summer, which I mean, I think they mean like, how do you deal with it? Okay, Brittany, I don't have a greenhouse and I'm going to tell you how I garden. I try to keep everything all natural. So I have a little garden going, even though I'm moving to my new property, Homestead Park, I just can't help myself. And I'm like, I have to at least grow a couple things. I'm not the best gardener in the world, but I have been doing it for years, and I'm like, I, I'm just learning everything the hard way. So I don't have a greenhouse because I live in Florida. I don't really need a greenhouse. And I used to try to start plants indoors. And then I'm just like, you know what? This is my cup of tea either. I don't want to do this. 
So now what I do is I just put, I just prepare the soil, I have great compost, just prepare, prepare the soil, and then I just put the seeds in the soil outside when it's time, after the frost is over, and just let it grow and just take care of it that way. And it's like so enjoyable. It's just, they start blooming. Right now I have some zucchini growing, tomatoes, a pepper plant, actually quite a few pepper plants. I did buy a patio pepper plant, but then my pepper plant started growing from seed. So I had some onions and I have my lemon tree. So I, I have a, um, you know, I don't want to do too much because like I said, I'm going to have to move all this stuff over. So I don't have a greenhouse. So I know, you know, some people really get into it and just have a lot of stuff going in that greenhouse. But just like starting your plants indoors, when you start plants in greenhouses, you can't literally just take them out of that greenhouse and plant it in the ground because the plant isn't adapted for that change like that. So you almost have to like set them outside, you know, in the morning for a few days and putting them back in the heat of the day, putting them back in the greenhouse. Or if I were to do it here, putting it back on the porch and you have to do that and then try to maybe plant it on a rainy day and like give it a chance or you're going to like grow all your stuff in the greenhouse. It's going to look fantastic. You're going to be like, oh, look at all this stuff. It's growing like a weed. And you're going to plant it outside. Is it going to be like, Whoa! is this going to be like dying? And you're going to be like, what happened? And that is what happens. It's just not acclim acclimated to go from greenhouse, boom, outside into the, you know, late spring, summertime and grow. So there is a little bit of work involved there. But, you know, you can get, you can get good at all that and you can do it for sure. <laughs> A lot of people can grow a lot of stuff in a greenhouse and then they'll take it to a flea market and the flea market will have a cover over it and you'll be like, oh, it's outside and you'll buy it and you'll go home and plant it in the sun and the same thing will happen. So you do have to keep that in mind. You know, you can't just take greenhouse, greenhouse plants and just go plop them in the ground. Same with flea markets. If it's under a cover, be careful when you take it home and just go plop it in pure sun outside. Izzy wants to know, how old should my chickens be to start feeding them mealworms or table scraps? What was the name, Izzy? Izzy. Izzy, that's a cute name. Okay, Izzy, well, what I do is for sure by two months old, you could be offering them anything you want. Anything you want by two months old. But I like to start a little younger with other things like when they're four weeks old, they're pretty small still, but you would be surprised what they can still swallow. And you know, that is the best time to start introducing things to them. And I'm going to tell you what I'll start giving them at four weeks old. Of course, they're going to still have their chick, you know, their um, little baby chick feed, chick starter. But what I'll do is I will cut back on that just a bit so they're not full. And so they're maybe a little bit hungry. And then what I'll do is I'll put in some whole oats and let them try to pick those and start eating those and surprisingly like you know don't like dump a whole bunch in there and waste them just like sprinkle a few in there and then just wait and you'll be surprised like pretty soon they'll, you'll look in there and they'll eat them all and so you can just start adding that you know with the chick start and then by four week by eight weeks you know i'm giving them whole corn and again like hold back a little bit on the chick starter so they have, they're hungry and they're going to be willing to try new food because, you know, it's like us, I always say, you're like, you just finished dinner, maybe had a little dessert and somebody comes up and be like, here, try this. And you're kind of like, oh, please, I'm full. I can't have another bite. So you got to look at the chickens the same way. If they're all stuffed on chick starter and you're like giving them like, here, try this whole corn. And you're like, well, it's not eating it. Well, that's why it's not hungry. <laughs> so, you know, you got to. You gotta like hold back a little bit. Of course, I'm not saying starve them, no, but you know, maybe offer the new fo foods first and leave it in there for half the day and see if, you know, if they're hungry, they'll start eating a little bit of it. And then maybe in the evening, their evening meal, give them the chick start. So do stuff like that. But always remember they need the grit too. So you're starting to feed them food, they need grit from day one because that's how they digest their food will really grind up their food and their gizzards. So make sure that you always give them the grit. 
We got a $5 super chat from Zakia. Thank you, Zakia. And Zakia says, thank you for sharing so much. Oh, you're welcome. I incubated six eggs and got three chicks. They're eight weeks old now. Is there a way to tell the difference between a rooster and a hen? Um, roosters cockatoodle too. <laughs> That's the best way to tell. So just wait and you'll see. I mean, I've looked it up and done extensive research and tried to do it myself. And it's very hard to tell a chicken, you know, the chickens apart. So, you know, some breeds when they are um, hybrids, which is a cross, you know, sometimes those will have a specific marking or specific wing feathers where they can tell. But if it's a heritage breed, which is an old fashioned, purebred chicken that's been around forever those are like you it, professionals can sex them like turn them over and pop their organs out and sex them which i mean you gotta be super careful because it's so tiny you don't want to hurt it so you know gotta be very careful with that so you know it's it's very hard to sex a chicken and like in a way who cares it's a surprise <laughs> wait and see You'll notice though when, um, depending what breed it is, but when they grow, roosters will seem to get a little bit of a rooster tail going on, you know, before the girls will. They just seem like they start developing that a little bit more. But I'm trying to think, like maybe eight weeks old, two months or so, you can just kind of, they'll, you know, roosters kind of strut their stuff and they hold their like neck in a certain way to cockadoodle do. Like you gotta look for those signs. And then, you know, of course, a lot of people don't want the roosters because they can't have them or they're just a pain in the neck. They're noisy. They just don't want to disturb their neighbors or whatever. So they'll raise them maybe to six months and eat them, or they'll try to rehome them, which I will tell you, it's difficult to rehome a rooster. You're like, hey, you want a rooster? <laughs> And everybody's, everybody's like, like, no, thank you. Yeah, everybody's like, runs. They don't even say no. They just turn around and start running. Like, nobody, it's very hard to rehome a rooster. So that's why a lot of people will just, you know, just eat them because, like, what are you going to do with it? <laughs> Unless you want to keep it. And then, you know, but when you hatch out six, you know, six chicks or three chicks and you have three roosters, now you're like, oh, boy, now what? <laughs> so it is, you have to keep that in mind when you're hatching your own chicks at, or you're letting your hen hatch out her own chicks like just count on it you're gonna have roosters to deal with so that's why sometimes buying from the store you know if you don't want to deal with all that is increases your chances of getting all girls if you buy the pullets you know it's you still can have a mistake in there and get a rooster but your chances are much higher that you'll get all hens if you get the pullets we got uh, our channel member, Amber. Hi, Amber. Says, good morning. And good morning. And did a 999 super chat. Thank you. With the cheerleader jumping up. Oh, so cute. So cute. You are the best with the emojis. <laughs> you could almost just speak with those things. You're really good at it. <laughs> which means you have a little artistic vibe going on in you, which I love that. So that's great. <laughs> No question, though, huh? Just the cheerleader? Just the cheerleader. <laughs> That's so funny. And Amber's in the chat uh, contributing. Uh, so um, Linda and Tony mm -hmm. say, Hi, Becky. Do you think a 5 by 10 Hi. chicken coop with a 20 by 20 run is big enough for eight chickens? No. A 20 by 20 run, is that what they said? Mm -hmm. 5 by 8. 5 by 10 coop. A 5 by 10 with coop. With a 20 by 20 run for 8 chickens. Well, if I was you, that might work if you get the, the docile breeds I was talking about earlier. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be getting the more feisty characteristic chickens. I would try to go for the mellow black astrolorps, cochins, maybe the red sex links try some of those and see how it goes and then don't be afraid to make adjustments be like okay this is my starting point yay be all excited about it and then just be like oh wait a minute wait a minute we're having a little trouble here or we're having a little bit of trouble here we got to like adjust it and fix it the five by ten coop what i find about those narrow long coops is 
it's very hard to place things without getting poop all over them because I personally would put the, the roost the long way. For eight chickens, you need a long roost. They have to spread out so they don't sleep on top of each other. So you're practically going to have chicken, 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 having eight chickens. So you got to go the long way, which has to be at least a foot away from the wall because, you know, you don't want to, they won't jump up there if there's not plenty of room. So that's only, and they hang out from that depending which way they're sitting, the poop falls. So that's not leaving you very much room at all for your nest boxes. You know, you're gonna, it's just going to be a very narrow, only being five feet wide. It's going to be a very narrow area to walk, you know, to try to hang a waterer, which I wouldn't put a waterer. All I would put in there were, would be nest boxes. But still, you don't have much room at all for a nest boxes. So you still could make that work, and I'm going to tell you how. Is maybe do two, because you don't need more than two, nest boxes in the corner. So you're having the roost, your narrow walkway. So down at the end, do two nest boxes and stack them. Of course, you're going to have a solid floor. And then put a little, you know, little part, a little lip on them so that they can jump up to the top one, whichever chicken prefers that, and lay in there. Or, you know, somebody could lay in the bottom. That's what I would do. I would probably do two wooden cubbies just over there. So you still would have barely enough room to walk in there down to the end, get them and then set up your feeders and everything outside. Now, another reason I don't like the narrow ones either is because in bad weather, rain, hot weather in the summer or whatever, they wanna be in that wooden hen house for, you know, coolness, shade, and, you know, protection from the wind and rain. And of course, that's just not very big for that many chickens to lay around in there. And you'll see they do like to hang out in there in the afternoons. So just keep that in mind. So like I said, you can always make adjustments. And what you might do for more shade, if that's the case, and you're like, oh, they're kind of crammed in there and it's not, it's not going well, or it's just too crammed in that little hen house. What you can do is cover part of the run you know, cover part of the wire run, put a roof over that so they can hide under that instead of going in the coop only. So if it's just sprinkling a little rain or they need shade. So like I said, you can do a rut, you can do adjustments. Sounds great though, go for it. We got a $4.99 super chat from Seeds and Sanity. Seeds and Sanity, thank you. And they said our first PBR, what's PBR? Purebred rooster? I don't know. I don't know. Started laying a week ago. How long can we keep eggs? Do we wash or refrigerate them? Also, do I need to clip wings? Thank you. I don't clip wings. You know, I have clipped wings in the past and I did a video on how to clip wings, but here's the problem. Those feathers grow back, especially if you're feeding them right and you're taking good care of them. Those feathers grow back so fast. If you think it's, a, it's like a chore to keep your dog's toenails clipped or like my horses, I trim their feet. Oh, chicken wings seem even faster they grow back. So keep that in mind. You're better off maybe having a coop with, um, you know, a three foot high run on it and have a fence, you know, wire top on that. So you don't have to keep clipping those wings. The eggs, I'm going to show you, like, I have had these eggs. Now I do rotate them, of course. It's getting full. <laughs> I have eggs that I keep on my counter, and I'll keep them on the counter for, like, maybe three weeks. And then if I don't give them away to somebody, I'll, um, you know, I'll put these on the bottom because I keep two of these in my refrigerator. And then the top ones I'm always eating. And then, so three weeks I'll keep them out here, and in the refrigerator I'll keep them a long time too. I, I can't even tell you how long. Months maybe I'll, unless I eat them or give them away. I never have never had a problem, ever. So just, you know, you, you'll learn. I don't wash my eggs. If you deworm your chickens, your eggs should come out perfectly clean. Now this egg is, has just a little few spots on it because uh, somebody broke an egg in there. And so a little bit got on it. But your eggs should come out perfectly clean. If your eggs aren't clean like this, you need to deworm your chickens. If you have poop stuck on your eggs, you need to deworm your chickens.
And where can people learn about deworming chicken? And you chicken? can learn about all this stuff because there is, you know, it's easy and anybody can do it. And I, of course, you know, I encourage everybody to do it. But there's things you do need to know. And so I wrote a little chicken book to help you with all this stuff. All these little, all these little things that once you know them, it increases your success so much. So I wrote this little book. And Scott, you say where to get it because you're always better the at that The link is in the me. description. Okay. They can hear you. The link is in the description. And then this, you know, um, what is this in here? <laughs> okay. So just for anybody that might also want to be curious about buying land because they're considering like, oh, maybe this homesteading thing is like, you know, interesting me. I'm curious to know about it. And of course, you know, having land would <laughs> move you in the right direction. I have a book about that. If somebody's to that point in their homesteading, they want to buy land, they want to move. There's a lot of things to consider when you're buying land. You know, you think you get so, so excited. And you're just like, oh, I'm going to go buy land. And you're just over the moon excited. And it's like, hold yourself back because it is so exciting. But that excitement can turn to misery and grief if you make some big mistakes because it is a big purchase. It is a big deal. So there's definitely things you want to know and so you can get this book and, and we've done it three times buying land yes. including one recently when we bought homestead park a year ago so. and i took notes through the whole process of buying homestead park because i'm like this will really can help make our buying land guidebook that much better yes. so i took notes i asked a bunch of extra questions and then all that information from just recently doing it and buying land again uh went into the book and we're good at it now so, okay, so that the same thing, the um, link will be in the description as well. But there's another place they can find the books if they want to just go browse around and look, which is where? Tell that. The links are all in the description. There's Amazon and then there's our website. That's what I'm talking about, our website. Yeah. What? And then click. Beckyshomestead.com and then you can click on store. Okay then, that's all I that's But all the all. link in the description goes right to there. It's fine though. They can just look it up. Maybe they're sitting around and want to just click on there later. Seed, go to my website. Go Seeds to store. Insanity did another four ninety nine super chat. Thank you. The exact same question. Seeds Insanity. So they can ask another question if they want. I'll try to find but it. But what? First of all, what was the? Let me finish their question. What else did they ask? Uh, I answered. How long can they keep the eggs? I answered Do you that. wash or refrigerate them? I answered that. And you need to clip their wings. I answered that. So you don't have to clip their wings if you have a nice coop for them. It's not mandatory. And it is a pain in the neck to do it, but that will prevent them from flying. And I don't know what kind of breed you have. What, what were those letters again? PBR. I have no idea. Okay, so no, I don't wash my eggs. And I do refrigerate them after three weeks of keeping them just on the counter. And there, I think I answered everything. <laughs> We got a four ninety nine super chat from Amber. Thank you, Amber. <laughs> our our channel member, uh, <laughs> Becky. Do you re recommend hay for nest boxes? Using cedar chips right now, and they're always falling out. I use hay. Hay's worked for me for you know decades. So I use hay. I don't use chips. Now, if I didn't have anything, yeah, in the chips, I had the chips, I would use them. But even cedar chips, I don't, I would rather use pine chips than cedar chips, personally. Um, and those, they might not be falling out. Those chickens might be, like, <laughs> getting them out because they don't like them. Because it is funny. I'll put hay in there. You know, of course, I'm like, oh, they, might, they want a lot of hay. You know, they, they might want a lot of cozy nests. And it's so funny because they always, always do it the same. They will get most of the hay out. And then in the end, it'll be a hay ring, and it'll just be the bottom bear. It's so funny. I guess they just want those eggs to be on the bottom and not in the hay. They just want the hay ring to hold them in place, the eggs in place or something. I don't know. I let them do their thing. I'm not like, you know, don't be a control freak with the animals. Just let them do their thing. They know what they're doing. They know what they're, they like. So you have to give them their freedom to be themselves. So I start out giving them plenty of hay, and then they, they take care of the rest. 
So I personally love hay, and that's what I use. Of course, that's what I have available all the time because I do have horses. Seeds Insanity says Plymouth Barred Rock. Oh, you have the Barred Rock, yes. So yeah, those are more of a feistier breed. I was talking about the personalities earlier. And so, um, you know, you might just want to have to put a wire top on your run, your wire run, and you know, keep it like that. So, and if you feed it right, and you can learn how to feed it, in my book, I talk about that, what to feed it so they lay really well. And that's the whole idea. You want to feed them right and keep them laying really well. So. You know, you can find that. And also, you know, I do, I have made lots of videos about it. So you can just like, if you have plenty of time, just sit there, go to my website, beckyshomestead.com, click chickens, and then you can just sit there and just go through the videos if you have plenty of time. That's why I made the book though. It's like, if you don't have plenty of time, you just want answers, <laughs> you know, you could just get the book and it's right there. And you know, in six months you'd be like, oh yeah, I am having this problem. Let me just go look it up quick. So <laughs> it makes it a little more convenient. But like I said, if you have the time, you could also watch the videos to find your answers. <laughs> it's up to you. Kristen wants to know if uh, they have to worry about their chicken hopping over a four-foot chain-link fence. Yes, yeah, some breeds will definitely hop over that fence. You would be surprised. They can fly pretty high. Other breeds won't. So I don't know what kind of breed, chicken breeds you have. Um, you know, it depends. Like a Cochin is probably not going to hop over that fence. You know, a, and it also depends what's on the other side of the fence, you know. If you have like neighbors that are like, here, chick, 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 and they're like throwing food out there, chickens have no concept of boundaries or owners, you know, anybody that calls them and throws them food, and, you know, the chicken's going to go over there. It's not like loyal to a person. So it depends what's on the other side of the fence as well. It's always, always, always better to have a chicken poop. Like, if you're going to have chickens, have a nice, big, awesome chicken coop. Like I said, the chickens live for years and years and years and years. Things change in life. There's going to come a time you're going away on vacation or some, you're sick, you're not feeling well, you have to work more, your boss needs you. And then you can just put those chickens in the chicken coop where they're safe and sound, feed them, still collect your eggs. Trouble free, no problems. So always, always have a chicken coop. You will not regret it. You will be like, thank God I have this chicken coop. It's peace of mind, let me assure you. Henry and Amber <laughs> both want to know about your horses. Oh. And Amber wants to know if you drive Charlie, your mule. I don't drive Charlie, I just want to ride him. And the reason, whoops, I dropped something. The reason I don't drive Charlie is because I drive Doodles, my donkey. And he's awesome, awesome at driving. And I have a little cart and a harness and all that already set up for doodles. And so I, I do drive doodles. Charlie, I just ride. He's amazing. He is a non-gated walking horse mule. So he's super forward. And so he is a blast to ride. And he's, um, it took a long time to train him though. He's very donkey-ish. Some mules are more horse-like, horse and so they're a little easier to train. And then there's the stubborn mules that are more donkey-ish, and they're not stubborn at all. They just take after the donkey parts, and they're actually, once you get them trained, they're better than the horse-ish mules, in my opinion. I just think they're better. They're smarter. They're just stronger. They're just calmer and think things through. They're not spooky. They're awesome. But you have to really take your time and train. So you're teaching and communicating. You're not disciplining. There's hardly any disciplining going on. You're just teaching, you know, and trying to communicate. But once you do get them trained, oh my gosh, you will just be like, yay, it's the best. <laughs> And that's how I feel with my Charlie boy. <laughs> and he's still learning. He's just getting better and better. But let me tell you, it's taken years of very, at times, frustrating hard work. But, you know, I'm the type. I stick with it. 
I don't give up. So many people would just, I'm sure of it. Charlie, if I didn't have him, he would have been like down the line, sold, 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 because he was very hard to train. <laughs> Walter wants to know how many nest boxes do you need for your chickens? Well, I always say one nest box per eight chickens. I will give them two, but let me assure you, they will all lay in one nest box. It's so funny. They'll just pick one they like, and then they'll line up. They have their pecking order, even when they're laying eggs, of who goes first, second, third, and then they'll just all lay in that box for whatever reason. The reason I have two, though, is I do have a rooster, so just in case somebody does turn broody and wants to hatch out babies, which I'm not allowing at this point because I'm moving soon, but if I were to, then mama could be sitting on her eggs in one nest box, and then everybody <clears throat> could still be laying eggs in the other nest box. So I, I would say just give them two for eight, per eight chickens. Dana wants to know how you deal with fire ants. Let me tell you something. That is the biggest pain in the butt on a homestead. Uh, it's just the worst. And I am basically live my life chemical free. I'm very picky, you know, in just fragrances for perfumes, soaps, cleaning products, anything. But one thing I will use a commercial ant killer. And I'm very sparing with it, and I will, you know, put a little bit. I do find they will not build their um, nest in a high activity area. So wherever you're like moving around a lot where there's animals, you know, you won't really find them. But you will find them, you know, on the edge, like if you have an orchard. Or a lot of times if you do compost in a garden, especially if you do a container garden, Ants will get in there. They just love that. So that is such a pain in the neck. And like I said, I will very carefully, very sparingly treat with a commercial ant killer. <laughs> and it never kills them all. Let me just tell you that. I think if you dumped that whole bottle on there, some would survive. Those are very resilient things, those ants. So don't bother over sprinkling, like putting tons. It doesn't kill them. What it does is just kind of chases them away. So just put a little bit. Uh, Daniel wants to know th about one of their chickens has a thin shell every other day or so and they're giving them oyster shells and everything hmm. but they're still having a thin shell every like third day. Um, well make sure you're giving them enough animal protein, meat, feed them plenty of meat, like make sure they're getting enough and it's the most important in the morning so make sure you give them that in the morning. And then just keep those oyster shells there. I mean, maybe it's a weird little chicken and it just eats the teeny pieces of oyster shell. So maybe just make sure there's like tons of it out there. And the shell so is made out through. of calcium and protein. Right. So they need protein too. It does need protein. So maybe get them some uh, mealworms. Yeah, give them some, get them some mealworms, some tuna fish, sardines, like just figure it out. Like if you have a lot of table scraps, you know, meat, give them that, like just anything you can give them, you know, and like I said, try to do that in the morning and then that's when it helps, so. We got a four ninety nine super chat from Linda and Tony. Thank you, Linda and Tony. And they want to know, do you give your baby chicks electrolytes the first day or the next day when they first come home? I'm so excited. I'm getting mine in July. I'm so happy for you. It's like, yeah. You're gonna love it. I never do personally. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I don't know. Sometimes I don't need that. I what I do when I've ordered them and they've come through the mail, you know, sometimes there are some dead ones in there, so don't be freaked out. Just for whatever reason, they just get too hot or whatever, they don't make it. And so, but the ones that make it, and sometimes they all make it. Just I'm just warning you that that you won't open the box and be broken hearted. It does happen and Sometimes they just die because there's something wrong with them. Like not every chicken makes it. You know, they're just so little and so delicate, even if your mom and hen hatches them. So don't be brokenhearted. Just, you know, be prepared that maybe. But what I do when I have those is, um, let, me, let me show them what I do. Let me just get this right here. This works so perfect for little chickens. This is a lid to a mason jar that you can buy at Walmart. 
It is like the perfect size and the per perfect depth. So I will fill this with water and then I'll get the little chicken and I'll like just touch its little beak in there, you know, and just show it the water. And I'll spend, you know, a few minutes with each one. I don't just dip it in there once and like put it over there. You know, I'll like make sure it gets a little. And it doesn't need much. It'll just whew, get it going, you know what I mean? And I'll do that to all of them. I don't know how many you ordered. Hopefully not too many. <laughs> Hopefully not 20. <laughs> And then, so do that, and then this also works really well with the food because I'm, it, they're so, so messy when they're little. You wouldn't think those, once they just kind of get their bearings, they're walking around good, they are so messy. So I love this because they will spill absolutely everything and get it dirty. And this is the best way to keep it clean. And then I'll just have the mason jar with the chick star in it. I'm going to show you. Let me see. I don't have a wine. That's the good thing about having a small homestead kitchen. Everything you need is right there. <laughs> Let me show them right here. Hold on. Hold on. I'm going to show you what I do. And for me, this makes it really easy. Okay, so I'll have the chick start in here with a spoon. And so I will just get a spoonful and put it in there. And that's all. They don't need like overflowing food all the time. That's the first thing you can do to help yourself to keep things clean and tidy because they will get messy fast and it'll just be, it'll be a big chore. So you just want to try to make it as easy as you can and as less messy as you can. So that's what I personally do. I'll give them like this three times a day. And then of course, they're going to tip the water over and step in it, it'll be dirty. And what's nice about this is it's not spilling too much water, so it'll be fine. Especially if you have sand, I would use sand on the floor of whatever little tub you keep them in. So it's like no problem at all. And then, um, you know, this, you can just easily just rinse it, clean it, and put it back in there. And then what I'll do is I'll just have some kind of a bottle filled with water, and then I can just add more water to it super easy when you're busy. Because don't forget, this is going to be going on for weeks. This isn't like just, a, you know, a <laughs> couple days, <laughs> weeks, you're going to be doing this. So, you know, you got to make it as convenient and easy for yourself as you can. So Okay, we're getting a lot of pony questions. Oh, we love the pony question. Okay, don't get me going on horses because so, I could talk about horses more than I could talk about chickens. Henry, Henry wants to know how much land do you need for a pony like Thunder? Uh, let me see here. So several people are asking about ponies. So just... How okay. much land do you need? How do you take care of a pony? Oh, somebody okay. said, how much does a pony cost? Uh, Perla. Perla wants to know how much a pony costs. Henry wants to know how much land you need. Okay, okay, slow down, slow down. Okay, so let me tell you this. Let me talk about ponies. Ponies are super cute, but they have a feisty personality. They're, they're more feisty, smarter, and stronger than horses. Even though horses are bigger, just if you consider size to size, you know, ponies are very smart, very strong, and very, um, like, they're robust. You know, they're, if you get a good one, and you, if you get a well-bred one, and you also get one with good conformation. So you got to know all that. Don't just, like, run out and buy a pony. But what we like to do is we like to get a stocky pony, like a Hefflinger breed, where an adult could ride it for short periods. You know, obviously you're not going to go ride that pony for eight hours. But, you know, if you wanted to hop on it for a little trail ride, you know, maybe do five, seven miles, no problem. The pony can handle it. I rode the pony for years. Also, it's like um, good for driving, too. You know, good sturdy pony. It can pull, you know, a couple, few people on all terrains, you know, not just flat pavement where it's easy. Um, so what was the other question? Oh, how much land do you need for a pony? How much do they cost? Okay, so a pony doesn't need like a big field of grass because no animal in the wild has big fields of grass. They're like nibbling around out west, the wild ones. Look where they live. It's like it ain't a field of grass. There's actually wild ponies near where we live. Yes. Not super, you know, over here. Yeah. There's, I've seen them. Yeah. And they're just like... Crazy little chubby wild ponies running around. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they're not going to grow too big because they're not getting... And so don't feed them any grain either. But what you do for a pony is you feed them hay. 
all the time. Just don't feed them grain. Don't put them in a big lush pasture all day. Like you could put them out there for a couple hours, maybe have an acre or two, put them out there, but then have an area where you keep him, what you might call a corral. You know, just think of the old Western movies where around the barn there's like a corral that's just dirt. It's not grass. And then you would put your hay roll in there and have your water trough in there. It would be fenced in and maybe make that, let's just say, make it 100 by 100 feet, your corral, nice sturdy corral. And then you just let your pony out when you want to. And if your field gets, you know, you're still going to have to mow your field. You can't just let it go. And then do that and have a little stall for your pony. So maybe one or two acres and then a 100 by 100 foot corral. And you just put big gate so you can put your hay roll in there. What I like about the pony is that I call I say that ponies are team players, <laughs> especially a draft pony. <laughs> if you get like a skinny normal little pony, like just a normal horse pony, I don't know about that. I've never actually owned one. But yeah, there's some scrawny looking ponies out it's there. It's just like a and you're small just like, horse. Mm, I would never get one of those. To personally. me, to me, there's a difference between like a regular horse pony and a draft pony. I would only buy a draft pony, which is like a Heflinger. What, what are some of the breeds? A Fjord, a Heflinger, even a Welsh pony. There are some good, mm -hmm. sturdy Welsh ponies out there, although Welsh ponies are pricey. Shetland ponies are nice, actually, but they have bred them. I, people get crazy. I don't know what is wrong with people, but recently people have just bred the Welsh ponies skinnier, more refined, more refined. It, this is what you look at. Look at their legs. If they have little broomstick legs, pass. Yeah, you want big, strong, stocky legs on a little pony. Stocky legs, big feet on a pony. That's what you want to see. And uh, I, say t I say ponies are team players. That's why I like them. They're so they're much with fun. The, they're with the family. They're really fun. The donkey's fun, too. He's fun. They're all fun. Let's, um, it's homestead fun. That's the good thing. Like, you don't... You just have your your fun right at home. It's amazing. Get a homestead, everybody. Let's unplug that mic and just use the, the little box because I'm still hearing that. The sound. whole time? It got loud right now for some reason. I don't know what. I think it might be that light bulb. <gasps> but let's just see. It's definitely, yeah, see, it, tur it turned off. I think the wire from the, the mic is picking up off that light bulb. So just clip it to your shirt. Okay, let me get on this. The I'm gonna get this one off. Yeah, I'm gonna get this one off because the sound is gone now. I hate mics. Well, it's the light bulb. Well, I'm, get a different light bulb that or light something. Bulb, that light bulb is going bad. That's the thing. That light bulb has concerns. been going bad. Yeah, that's a thing that happens. I don't want it on the inside of my shirt. Who cares at this point? Yeah, see, it's perfect now. Well, it's already an hour. We're almost leaving. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, oh, so, so much better. at least we so figured it out. Better. I'm going to take that light bulb out and throw it away as soon as we oh, finish. Oh, it's definitely a problem. They'll, they'll be like, what's that sound? So it's the light, this light bulb is And we bad. don't blame anybody. When you listen to something and there's this irritating sound in the background, oh, my gosh. It's like, to me, I'm just like, I can't even do it. <laughs> you know, Linda and Tony are reminding me in the chat that it's almost time to stop. It <laughs> is. It's for time. Becky. They're, they're like our assistants. Yeah. We got people... I was like, wait a minute, whose side are you on? <laughs> My side. Thank you. Uh, but wait, we got a couple Appreciate super chats that. while you were talking about ponies. So Amber did a 99 cent super chat with a Thank uh, you, Amber. A little unicorn. <laughs> he shows me yours. Oh yeah. It's so fun. So much fun. Oh my gosh. Horse camping is so much fun. You just go camp, you wake up in the morning, your horse is right there, you like have a little breakfast. Tack up, just go get lost in the woods. It's so relaxing, <coughs> so quiet. It's just amazing. And you come back, and of course, you got to take good care of the horse. You feed it, get it all, get all happy and settled. And then everybody just like chills out in the afternoon and kind of does their own thing. And then everybody comes back together late afternoon, maybe take another ride or just socialize and cook dinner together and then you just like sit outside and look at the stars and have a little fire. I don't like big fires. You know, I just like to have a little, I, I tell people I can be mesmerized by a candle flame. It's just so relaxing. So just sit out, you know, relax. Oh, it's so much fun. I, I, I swear I could go for like 10 days horse camping. 
That's when you have to have your homestead set up really well with all your chicken coop, all your pens, so when you have a pet sitter come, it's easy for them. Otherwise, nobody's going to do it for you. Daniel has a good one here talking about how they take the chicken poop out of the coop and make poop tea and then put it on their plants. Yes, you can do that. And I'm going to tell you something, Daniel. Another way to do that is you can have garden ducks. And what you do is you have the little swimming pool right in the garden. And then the ducks, like, they just poop in the water. And so you're like homemade poop tea. It's like you don't have to do anything, no shoveling or anything. And then you just have a little bucket. And you can just scoop it out of there and dump it on the plants. And I would get bantam ducks. If you search online for bantam ducks. They're, they're really also warm. called call ducks, bantam ducks. And then also, I do love the runner ducks because they can reach so high and get the bugs off the plants. So that's what I'm going to have. And then we got a $2 super chat from Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. And Brenda wants to know if a hen can be kept alone. I mean, does anything want to be alone? I mean, you can. You can keep it alone. I mean, it's not going to verbally like tell you it's not happy and complain. But, you know, I always try to at least get two because that way it has a buddy. I think at night when the hen's alone in the coop, it's just like, you know, they're already kind of feeling vulnerable. Then it's alone. It, you know, if it has its hen next to it, it could be like, did you hear that? <laughs> they could have each other scoop closer together. When it's alone, it's just going to be sitting there you're like stressed out. So I would say just get another one maybe. Look into that, see if you have room. I mean, Well, that's why we designed the city coop and the flip coop for two chickens. Yes, for that reason. So, just, that's what I think. <laughs> okay, well, we are going to wrap it up unless there's more questions. Well, do you want to give an update on Homestead Park before we end? Oh, okay. That is exciting. So exciting. Okay, so we've been over at Homestead Park like several times a week, you know, just going over there all the time mowing which we only have push mowers so it's so much to mow it's it's beautiful and it's a lot to mow so we've been getting good exercise doing that but we had the septic people it's all scheduled we came out and it's so interesting people need to realize this when they buy property it's not like you have let's just say you buy 10 acres and you're like i want the house right there well, you might not be able to put your house right there because when the septic people come out, they have this little soil tester. And in order for, you know, to do a cheap septic, now you can spend a fortune probably and have Well, yeah, if you spend enough wherever money, you, you want. Can have anything you want if you spend enough money. But I like to keep it simple cuz that way in 20 years it's still running well cuz there's not a lot of parts to it. So the point I was going to make is, you know, you might say, I want my house right there. But when they do the soil testing, they'll say, well, you can't put the septic there. And it might be tricky, which Homestead Park is kind of tricky because on part of the property, there's a lot of clay. And then there's a part of the property that is more sandy. I was digging to put the mailbox in. I'm digging with the post hole diggers. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's like, boom, hitting something. I'm like, oh, it must be a, must be a root, a big root. Ugh, ugh. And I move over a little, like, a, you know, one, six inches, and boom, hit, and I'm like, oh, well, that's a lot of roots here. And I, like, get down there, and I look, and I'm like, no, I'm hitting clay. Which there are a lot of roots there, too. Like, hitting, was. hitting that clay, it's like, boom, it's like hitting a, a concrete slab. Yeah, it's very dense. <laughs> but it does hold the water well, and the trees seem like they love it. Like, the trees are big, mature growth trees over there, so. So the septic person was going around, trying over here, try over there. Because I wanted my cabin in a very specific place. So I'm like, try over here, try over there. So he was trying his best to try to get a spot to and where. So then finally, my mom is like, Ugh, forget it. And she walks away. And then we're just standing there. And I'm like, well, how about over here, over here behind where the truck was parked? And we go over there and he's digging. And, I, and I, he's pulling up like yellow Florida sand. And I go, I'm no expert, but that looks like Florida gold. <laughs> and he started laughing. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is a good spot. He's like, we can do a normal septic range. Oh, and you're just like, thank and God. Like, oh. Because otherwise they can do a mound where it's like the tank itself is above ground and you got to kind of just mound I the dirt it, up uh, around there. I call it Poop Mountain. Which is so ugly. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. Because over here, of course, it's buried. You can't even see where it is. It's like, yeah, that's like really ugly. So I really didn't want that. 
So thank God we found a spot. I did have to move my cabin a little bit, you know, to a little bit, but it's okay. You know, I can live with it. I'm not that picky, you know. I, I had a general vicinity of where I wanted it, so it's it's close. So, so we're, we we paid the deposit on the septic. Yes. Gave them the, they needed a copy of the blueprints, a copy of the survey. Yes. So that's just. The wheels are turning on that now. We paid the deposit. Which, it's going to be over a month before the septic's in. So that takes time. So don't, just remember all this when you're, you're like, you know, developing a homestead yourself, that all this stuff takes time. It's not like, you know, is it going to be done in a week? It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's like. And then I, to, so the septic guy said, well, you have to remove this tree to put the septic here in this good spot. So I had the tree service come out, who I've used before. So this is the second time I've used them and they took out three trees. They took out a tree that was like right in the middle of the driveway. So with that one tree removed from the driveway, she can get her horse trailer in, the, you know, the fire truck. And most importantly, the cabin. The cabin, like everything. It's like with that one tree. We needed a big wide opening. Just removing that when now the driveway, because I don't want to remove any trees. So I like Homestead Park because of all the trees. And so we took that one tree out. We took the tree out that was by the septic area, which was just kind of this scraggly tree. It was like, whatever. And then one old tree looked like it was dying anyway, right where the cabin's going to go. So we yeah. took out three trees. And so... And we did learn something very interesting, which I never knew this and a tree person told us, is... We have lantern tree over lantern tree over there, which I love that tree. I'm in love with that tree. It's a big cedar, huge cedar. And through the years, somebody cut the branches so you can go under it. So it looks like this just just gorgeous tree. Well, the tree we were gonna have actually removed and have it dug up and move the roots, the tree man said, Don't do that. And even though it looks very far away, he said that's what kills the tree next door, is when you dig up all those roots because they're touching and tangled together, and that could kill lantern tree. I'm like, oh no, we're not even chancing that in the slightest bit. We are gonna like just cut that tree down, and then those roots can just you know rot and disintegrate under there. And while they were there, I made them put the stump for that big tree over by the shed because I'm like, my my mom loves stumps, <laughs> so I'm like, here's your gift. Stump. Well, people come over. It's so odd, but people come over, and if you just have a few stumps, you know, on your porch or wherever, people just sit down, you know. They don't feel like they're going to get something dirty or ruin it, and they'll just plop down, and you can just enjoy and talk for a few minutes. It's awesome, and then you can do stuff on there. If you, I like to make stuff and work. You can, like, pound. You can do stuff on there. We got a nine ninety nine super chat from Amber, which says Amber. thanks. Oh, so cute. Look at that. That is well, thank you, Amber. Amber, you're so funny. <laughs> our, it's our artistic, our artistic fan. Okay, well, anyway, and, we do. Hold on, hold on. We okay, have a couple sorry, saying it's, where there's a uh, kerfuffle here. Oh. Straw or hay? I like hay. Straw is hay. I don't know if anybody knows that, but what it is, it's the same thing. There's just no seeds in straw, and they let it grow tall. So it like ho it gets tall and hollow with no seeds in it. That's what straw is. So it's not like it's this completely other thing. So I just use hay, you know, with shorter pieces. Straw, straw is like, you know, like sometimes I always tell my hay guy, like I like the longer hay because it's more fiber. And, you know, it's, they have to chew it more. And shorter hay is softer and sweeter and, you know, probably not as good for the horses technically, although they'll eat that better. So, you know, it's the same thing. So you might as well just use hay because it is shorter pieces and they'll make a better nest out of it than hollow, big, long straw. And the last question from Kristen Okay, Kristen. And they want to know, what's your favorite homestead animal? My mule. <laughs> you notice how fast I say that? <laughs> I love them all. You know what I mean? Like, I enjoy every one of them. My turtle, my dogs, my chair, like everything. I just love it all. But the one that has a soft spot in my heart is Charlie, my mule. <laughs> just because I love horses. I'm horse crazy. I have been horse crazy since I was little. Mule crazy, horse crazy. You know what I mean? So that's why they're my favorite because they're fun and beautiful and I've just always liked them. Amber says this is Scott's after party where we <laughs> talk about the 
Homestead Park. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting, so exciting. I can't wait till we shoot over there. It's gonna be pretty, so nice. I'm working on my pecan trees now too. I'm learning all about them and how to fertilize them and like how to get them to bloom better. And I think I have to buy another pecan tree of a different variety so they can cross pollinate. I think I'm having, whoever planted those didn't do two different varieties. I think it's the same variety. We'll see, I'm trying to figure all that out, so. But I am determined because I am, am thrilled I have pecan trees on that property. <laughs> and somebody asked, I, I lost it on here, but they want to know if we're going to build the house. But we're, what we're doing is moving this log cabin, we're moving it to Homestead Park. There's something about it. And then I'm going to build my house as a steel building, which I think is the best, currently the option. best option for building your own house. Because housing is very expensive, and if you can get that taken care of in your life, it's and be mortgage makes your life free. so much better. And so you'll be a me, different person. I think right currently a steel building is definitely the way to go. Yes, it is. Now, when I did my cabin, a cabin was the way to go. It was it was a great price. You know, it was it was just worked out so good. I afforded it. You know, so but now those shot up in price. They're very pricey. So now a steel building is the best way to go. Deb wants to know why it's called Homestead Park. Because it's so beautiful. This is Becky's homestead, but that's, we just went over there and I'm just like, oh, it's so beautiful over here. It's Homestead Park. <laughs> so that's why we call it that. You know how some people name their residences or what, their estates. Well, when we first stepped foot on it, I, I looked around and I go, it looks like a park. And we said Homestead Park. Yeah, we just together came up with the name. It's so nice, so beautiful. Can't Chris, wait. Kristen, Becky just answered your question about the favorite animals. You got to rewind it and watch it. <laughs> okay, so we will see you next week. I give a huge thanks to all my um, Super Chat people. We appreciate it so much, and it's always a joy to talk to everybody, and we'll see you next Sunday. Happy homesteading. Bye.